Well, good morning. My name is Steve Rennie. My friends call me Wren, and this is my Wren Baron flying channel. Today, I'm going to be flying to the Montgomery Field in San Diego, California to play some golf with an old buddy at the world-famous Torrey Pines Golf Course, and I couldn't be more excited about it. But before we start playing golf, we got to get there. So let's start our flight the same way we'd like to start our round, by keeping it in the middle of the fairway putting in a little bit of power. I'm going to look for 77 knots and I'm going to gently curl back on that side yoke and this little baby is going to pull herself off the ground. Flaps at 90. I'm pulling back power ever so slightly. The plane has a tendency to uh, jump in the yellow pretty quickly if you shove the throttle all the way forward. I'm hitting my flight level change to capture 120 knots. I've hit the heading button to make sure I'm going in the right direction. Um, there's a great view off the runway that you'll only see in a plane. I'm keeping track of my altitude. At 760 feet, my airframe parachute is active. That was that little nod right there. Once I've got that active, I'll now switch it over to autopilot and let my little Cirrus do some work for me. Now you'll notice at the HSI and the PFD that I'm using OBS to track the LAX315 radial as part of the departure procedure. Once I get there, I just turn the heading bug to 250 and the plane tracks that course. Here's a great look at what you see very often at Santa Monica Airport. A little bit of IFR right out of the box. Nothing crazy, but enough to make you happy to have an IFR rating. Okay, I've contacted SoCal. I've gotten my first instruction, which is typically a turn to 270 and climb to 4,000. And I love to keep track of where I'm going on the uh, MFD map. And once everything is going properly, I switch over to my climb checklist, rich of peak technique, and methodically go through each item and make sure everything is set as required. Once I've completed that climb checklist, I'll pre-select the next checklist, which is the cruise checklist, and then back to the map. Okay, we're getting another vector turning us further to the north as the controller swings us back around towards Santa Monica and then ultimately south to San Diego. A little beep is our reminder that we're closing in on our cruising altitude of 4,000 feet. Okay, there's our direct to Santa Monica. I've already got Santa Monica VOR highlighted. I hit direct, enter, enter, nav, and the plane turns to the right as planned. Okay, so we're going to contact a new controller as we head direct to the Santa Monica VOR. So I'll go to the FMS and dial in the new frequency, which you can do up top, but you can also do it right here on the FMS. Get her all dialed in, switch it over, and make the call. Okay, at this point we're about 3.1 miles from the Santa Monica VOR. And the controllers now ask us to fly a 140 heading out of SMO. That will typically put us right over the top of LAX. All right, we now also have a little time to finish up our cruise checklist. By now, I've pulled back power, I've adjusted the mixture, I've confirmed that the fuel pump is on, and I'm just about ready to complete the checklist. 
Once it's done, it's back to the map. Memory Fox is here, fighting 140. Okay, so dial in 140 on the heading bug. Press heading, and the plane starts turning to the right. Memory Fox is here, I'm making 5,000. Now, typically when I'm making a climb, from cruise altitude. I would do it in what's called full power climb mode. That means I'd be pushing the mixture full, I'd be pushing power to 100%, I'd be clicking the flight level change button and rolling the dial back to 100 to 125 knots climb speed. Today I'm gonna to do it a bit differently and use the cruise climb technique and here's how it works. First thing I'm gonna do is press the flight level change button, then I'm gonna dial in the selected altitude. And then I'm gonna use the dial to pitch the nose up and capture 125 knots climbing speed. Let's see how we're doing. If you look at the top of the PFD, you'll see we're getting 1,000 feet per minute, which is great for just about any day. And that's good to see because I decided to use this technique today because when you're traveling through the Southern California airspace, you're constantly getting step ups and it requires me to go through my cruise checklist over and over and over again. And this makes it a lot simpler. Okay, so we've got a turn to the right of 150, which we dial in on the heading indicator. I'm always keeping my eyes on the map, but sometimes it gets a little bit cluttered. So you can just push a little button here and declutter it. For me, sometimes less is more. There's so much going on with the Garmin Perspective system that it's easy to get lost in the cockpit and forget to look up and enjoy the view. Right here, you got a great view of the Palos Verdes Peninsula with the clouds tucked up against the shore as usual and the sun shining. Anybody who wonders why I love California, take a look. Okay, back in the cockpit, I'm starting to gather some information on our destination airport. I pulled it up on the Waypoint Info information page, and I'm cheating by pushing the weather button and taking a peek of what the weather is before we get there. And also, flying the plane. Turn right, 170. Uh, the Cirrus Perspective system in autopilot makes it multitasking a breeze. Okay, select Seal Beach, hit direct, enter, enter, nav, and our little Cirrus starts turning left to Seal Beach. You get a great view of the Long Beach Harbor, home of the Queen Mary. While I was able to check the weather at Montgomery Field on my MFD, what I didn't know was what runway and approach they're using. Okay, so now we know it's runway 28 and we'll be doing an ILS approach. So we're going to hit the procedure button, select approach, pick the ILS 28, select vehicle. I'm going to skip minimums for now. And scroll down and load the approach. Okay, now that I've got the approach loaded, it's time to brief it. Okay, so the first thing I do is go to my Waypoint Information page for Montgomery Field in San Diego, and you can see right here that I have a graphical representation of the approach, including the initial approach fix Bakel uh, on my map. I can also go to my flight plan page to get more information on the airport and the runways. And also to look at the approach plate for the ILS 28 right approach to Montgomery Field. Now the Garmin Perspective System has a great feature if you're using Jeppesen charts. Now as most people know, the approach chart includes a lot of information and the actual physical representation of a chart is actually much more vertical than it is horizontal, which makes it clumsy to actually scroll through to see all the information on, on the MFD. But the Perspective Plus system gives you a one-touch option to see all the various sections on the chart. Right here, I'm looking at the minimums. Right here, I'm looking at the header, which provides me information on the frequencies, uh, the localizer frequency, the approach course, the final approach fix, um, touchdown zone and elevation, etc. 
Here I'm looking at the profile view, which gives me all the waypoints along the final approach course, including the final approach fix and the elevations that I need to be at at each step of the way. I also have missed approach information there as well. And as you can see, I'm taking all this information and putting it into my flight notes so that it's easily accessible when I'm actually in the approach. And then finally, I have the plan view, which shows me all this information on a map, the final approach fix, the initial approach fix, and also the missed approach procedure uh, in the event that I have to go missed. And once that briefing's done, it's back to the map. So now if you're wondering what that little blue device is sitting on the passenger seat, that's my life vest. And if you notice on the map there, there's a whole lot of blue that we're flying over right now. And so whenever I'm flying over a bunch of water for any extended period of time, I like to have that life vest right next to me, just in case. And the off chance I have to uh, land out here somewhere, I'm pretty confident that I can pull that parachute and live. I certainly don't want to drown, so that's what it's doing there. Okay, so we've now descended from 6,000 feet to 5,000 feet. It's a good time to go through the descent checklist. Okay, the last item on the landing checklist is check the brake pressure. It's all good. Now we'll complete the checklist, load the before landing checklist, and then as always, back to the map. Okay, by now we're approaching one of our final uh, waypoints on the way into San Diego, and ATC has instructed me to turn left 110 degrees and start setting up for vectors to the final approach course. So I dial in the 110, put it in heading mode, and the plane starts to turn left as commanded. At this point in the flight, I've loaded my approach, I've briefed my approach, and pretty soon it's going to be time to activate that approach. The easiest way to do that is through the flight plan, hit the procedure button, and then pull down the activate approach function, which will take you directly to the initial approach fix. While that might work in most cities, in Southern California, you rarely get a direct to the initial approach fix, so more often than not, you're dealing with vectors to final. With that thought in mind, I decide to activate vectors to final, and something interesting happens. If you look at the CDI needle, you'll notice that it's turned green and is now tracking the localizer, not GPS. Now, while I was a little surprised to see the CDI needle turn green so early, I didn't think much of it at this point, but the impact of choosing vectors to final on this ILS approach will become obvious in a few minutes. Now, the controller has told us to go direct to Bakel. So I pull up my flight plan and start to look for Bakel. But now it's no longer part of the flight plan. So I decide to start over. I select the ILS 28 right approach. I select Bakel as the initial approach fix, and then I activate the approach. With Bakel highlighted, I hit the direct to button, enter, enter, and then nav. And then nothing happens. So I try to enter it again, direct, enter, enter, nav, and nothing. So I try to activate the approach again, nothing. I hit the approach button to arm the approach, nothing. <laughs> I try direct to Bakel again, still nothing. I look on the scorecard and see that I've got direct to Bakel, the flight director is working, so I decide to overpower the autopilot to stay on the pink line. So all of this goes on for about three and a half minutes, trying one thing after another with no results. I finally figure it out by switching the CDI needle to GPS and then I'm back in business. With Bakel highlighted on the flight plan, I hit direct, 
Enter, enter, nav, and lo and behold, the plane starts turning to Baco. So what exactly went wrong? So to figure it out, I decided to refer to my trusty Garmin Cirrus Perspective Plus manual. Now, most folks are not really interested in reading a 600-page manual. But there's a big difference between programming the remote control for your TV and flying an airplane. So I've spent countless hours going through that manual, but no matter how many times I've read through it, inevitably I find something new or something I missed. In most cases, when flying an ILS approach, the needle turns green somewhere on or near the final approach course. Normally, when you're flying an ILS approach, you have GPS guidance until the CDI switches and you've captured the glide slope. But this time, when I activated vectors to final and the needle turned green, I was no longer getting GPS guidance. And here's why. According to the Garmin manual, when you select vectors to final on an ILS approach, the needle does in fact turn green, but you don't get GPS guidance. And without some GPS guidance, I could have done direct twos all day long and it was never going to work. If it's true that every flight is a learning experience, here's what I learned today. First off, when you activate a vectors to final, you lose any waypoints on the flight plan that are not directly on the final approach course. In this case, I lost the initial approach fix, Bakel, and so when instructed to go direct Bakel, I couldn't find it. And secondly, I learned that when you activate vectors to final on an ILS approach, you lose your GPS guidance. Okay, so I've got our clearance to land at Montgomery Field, so I make the turn to heading. I push the approach button. I switch the needle to the localizer. I set a new altitude of 2,500 and now I start pushing the nose down and pulling a little bit of power. And just like she's supposed to, she starts turning toward the course and things are starting to look good again. Okay, on to the before landing checklist. Everything is good. I've moved my mixture up. I've adjusted the power a bit. I got my fuel pump on and uh, we're ready to start tracking the course. Okay, now I'm having to change the frequency because I had a little bit different frequency already loaded for Montgomery. We're coming from a little different direction. So I change that and then I switch over to COM2 where I have tower and ground on the same frequency and I keep them separate. And on the way in I just hit the COM2 button. Alright, I'm cleared to land on runway 28 right. Things are looking good. Alright, now the glide path is in and we are following it down. We're on the course, we're on the glide path. Got good speed, we're a ways out. Okay, now, because I kept putting in all those different approaches, I neglected to put the minimums in. So I'm putting them in now, a little late, but better than never. Because I still want to make sure I'm good for all my 1,000 foot, 500 foot, 100 foot call outs on the way down. So I asked for a wind check there, and he tells me it's 350 at 4, which means it's quartering a little bit in front of me and from the right, which is not horrible. Okay, the traffic controller is letting me know that there's going to be a plane turning in front of me, but he's going to be on the runway to the left, and I'm going to take the big 
runway to the right. Okay, I'm 500 feet above the ground. Airspeed. Alright, I'm slowing down as I get near the runway. I've disengaged the autopilot now, I'm hand flying it in. I'm trying to manage my speed so that I'm just about 80 knots as I get over minimums, the runway minimums. and reducing my speed until I hit my uh, aiming point. So far so good. Cramping ever so slightly into the wind for that tiny little crosswind. Speed is good. I'm just slowly and steadily reducing that speed. No jerkiness allowed. Got it right over the numbers, looking good, speed's good, nice and soft. Okay, there it is, right down the center cut. Delta Alpha, Marco Tower, Roger, Southwest. Delta Alpha, Marco Tower, Roger, Southwest. Delta Alpha, Marco Tower, Roger, Southwest. 